Okay, we're ready to go. Thank you all for joining me this Thursday, August 1st, first of the month. July was a very good month. I got a lot done. We had some great shows. Our day techs have really been progressing in, in terms of, you know, uh, working through the material in a, in a constructive manner that I think is helping people which is my goal, right? <laughs> that's the idea. So if that's happening, that's all I need to know. And so with today's reading, we're going to wrap up, at least for now, right? We're gonna come back around and I will by that time probably have translated more of Revelation. And so we'll go back through what I've done and then we'll go through the, the new material. But today will be the last one this time, our first time really. And um, then in a couple of weeks, about the middle of August, we're going to start with Genesis. Now, in, um, in Genesis and in most of the Hebrew Scripture texts, we not only have what I've translated to date in terms of the Hebrew Aramaic texts, but I've also done the Greek text, why it, which is why in part it's taking me longer uh, than it might otherwise. So, for example, in Proverbs... I've, I'm doing both the Hebrew and Greek so that you can see the, the similarities and differences in how these texts were pre, uh, preserved and presented from ancient times through to today. So, but we're going to finish with Revelation. We just have several verses here. And then we're going to talk a little bit more about the Alpha and the Omega today and wrap up that series as well. And then tomorrow... Or, or later today, I should say. Slight chance tomorrow. But I'm planning on doing a live stream later today. Part 7, the last uh, scheduled or planned part for now on this series involving Jesus and Michael. As the Biblical Archangel, Part 7, later today, you can check for the notice after the uh, day tech show. So let's finish up with Revelation. We'll do our reading, talk about a few things, and then we'll talk about the Alpha and the Omega, one more time. Okay, we're going to read Revelation 22, 10 through 15. And there it says, it's very important as, as always when you're reading Revelation to recognize who is speaking. Now, that may not be entirely clear in our reading, but that's why after we're done, we're going to talk more about it. And we're going to stay in Revelation 22 pretty much. But I'm going to show you something I haven't shown you yet. Not, not in the way I want to. Okay, Revelation 22.10. The one speaking says to me. Now, I believe this is an angel. And I believe I can show you this is an angel. Because I believe the text tells us it's an angel. And I believe it's an angel who rejects the kind of worship that would be appropriate for Jesus or Jah. So he's clearly one of the angels, <clears throat> excuse me, that has been sent by Jesus after God gave Jesus the revelation. Revelation 1.1. And that angel or one of the angels Jesus used to communicate this to John is talking to him right here. <laughs> Just like the angels have been talking all along. For these other beings... Um, unless it's John talking. All right, so the one speaking to me, I I'm going to show you after we're done, this is an angel. Not, not Michael the archangel or the prince of the army, just an, an, a messenger angel who has not been given authority or appointed to a position deserving of the kind of honors and descriptions that we read about for um, the prince of the army of Jehovah, the great prince, and of course, for Jah's firstborn son. <clears throat> the one speaking to me says, you must not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Verse 11, the one doing what is wrong must still continue to do what is wrong. And the one who is unclean, this is very interesting, we'll talk about it, must be made dirtier still. And the righteous one must still continue to bring about righteousness. And the holy one must be made holy still. 
Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give back to each one as much as is his work. Verse 13, I am the A and the Z, Alpha and the Omega, first and the last, the beginning and the end. Now, I'll stop here and just point out, as I have before, our best text, uh, witness to this text, Codex A, reads differently here from what Jesus says in Revelation 1.17 and 2.8 consistent with Revelation 1, 5, that he's the firstborn from the dead. It calls him the firstborn and the last. Here it does not use firstborn. And it connects all of the titles in a sort of, um, you know, parallel meaning. It's restating the same thing, basically. No reference to coming alive or dying, just like you have both times with Jesus in Revelation 1 and 2 and his use of firstborn or first and last, both times, right after 1-5. Yet nowhere else does the Alpha and the Omega ever say anything like that. Neither does the Alpha and the Omega first and last beginning and the end say that here. He says, verse 14, happy are those who wash their clothes so their authority will be over the tree of life and so they might come in through the gates leading into the city. Verse 15, the dogs are outside, <clears throat> along with the practicers of magic, people who cast spells, try to control people, manipulate things, rather than rely on Jah or just be honest and do good work, they try to cheat people. They try to lie steal with these tricks. When if people did those same tricks to them, they'd flip. So they're inconsistent, contradictory, hypocrites. And the grossly immoral people, and those who murder, and those worshiping idols. Remember, John closed his, la his letter by warning people, my children, stay away from idols. Why do we have all these idols in so many of these quote-unquote churches? doesn't make any sense. Do they not understand what an idol is? Something that you put faith in or use as part of your worship? doesn't matter if you don't worship it. Why are you using an idol? It does matter, of course. It says worshiping idols. But, I mean, basically, if you're using the idol as a, as a means by which you're recognizing the thing you're worshiping, you're effectively worshiping that idol. You may deny that, but why even take a chance, right? Why do you have all these idols in these places of worship? Either way, that's for each person to choose and be judged. All those who enjoy and who continue putting forth a lie. Those are the ones who are outside. So, you know, we've all done things to some extent that we're not happy about. We know we sin, we make mistakes, and yet we're still to be holy, right? Calls people holy and to be made holy still, showing there's really not a, an absolute sense in which the people are holy at the time and then being made holy still, right? Because if they were absolutely holy, they couldn't be made holy still unless it's a maintaining of that holy. Either way, we're viewed as that in the sense that we're approved because we're doing God's will. We're giving him glory. We're, we're witnessing to God and to Christ. We're giving evidence. We're not just stating what we hope is true in life. We're saying, look, look at history. Look at the facts. Look at what's going on now. Life from life, everywhere around, intelligent marks of design, utility. I mean, come on. How much more do we have to see? before we're not the ones who seem crazy. And we're not. <laughs> we're looking at evidence. How's that crazy? Give me a break. Where's your evidence for the magic? Just because you're manipulating and damaging people? Get out of here. <laughs> That's terrible. And there's no evidence you're doing anything but doing just that, damaging people. Grossly immoral actions have never resulted in any kind of enduring kind of love. It just damages people. If you're going beyond the normal hetero way, right? You have the male organ, you have the female organ. There are more organs. I'm talking about, <clears throat> excuse me, didn't get my morning voice going quite yet. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. If you go hetero and you use your bodies the way you're made to, we can all look at ourselves naked in the mirror if we want to. We see we have things. We don't even need a mirror, right? We can see. Okay, you have those things. I, it's not hard. I, it almost sounds stupid talking about it because it's so basic. Yet people today, it's like they've forgotten 
what they have or what to do with it and and what's not a good thing to do with it right the other things people do so it's not hard to see what's grossly immoral versus how we're made keep it hetero you'll be fine <laughs> pretty much you still have to be cautious of course but i mean if you're grossly immoral anal sex all kinds of abuse that doesn't work or just two women again you don't have the parts and if you have to make something manufactured from synthetics fake stuff then you're really not trying hard enough are you <laughs> because there are plenty of men out there who have the real thing and all you need to do is find one and if you can't find one well then what does that say right then maybe you should just focus on you and do what you're supposed to do outside of the design you have it's one or the other you either find someone that you can fit with and complement and work together or you don't but grossly immoral gaining but well, that's just going to destroy you faster hurt other people and affect you up here and maybe everywhere all right disease all kinds of stuff you can't get away with just being too loose and open with you know your sexual practices and stuff it will come back to you i met a man a couple weeks ago um, as part of the work i do who had aids he's had aids for 30 years and he's been taking medication to keep him alive that whole time still practicing you know homosexual sex he's a nice guy that's nothing to do with that right it's, i'm talking about the practice there's all kinds of nice people who worship idols that's, they're not doing they're doing something that offends the one who made them so we're to stay away from them let god deal with them doesn't matter if they're nice different times we can recognize other things in a person's life that are concern enough to where while we still are friendly with people we still would help people if i saw a homosexual being attacked by heterosexuals or anybody i would jump in immediately and stop that or do what i can right that's what we're told to do that's what jesus said to do who's your neighbor the one who who helps the person you don't think they'd help in a condition where it's going to require something of yourself okay that will always be what i and i know other real christians stand for it doesn't matter it could be a practicer of magic it could be an idol worshiper if we see somebody in need or in trouble we react to it you know we don't throw away our life needlessly my point is we don't hold things we don't hold the practices like this against people in our normal dealings this is for jaw to judge what we're reading here is not our judgment of these people and what we're going to do to them this is what the bible says is going to happen to the people who have been damaging the earth right they've been trying to control people with magic they have been grossly immoral to the point where they damage themselves and other people they murder and worship idols and the final thing it says they not just lie they enjoy putting forth the lie okay so that's how they handle things their their means of communication of dealing with people is to lie and you and i we try to tell the truth okay they're not playing by the same rules you understand <clears throat> they're playing by a different set of rules knowing that they can fool you because you're trying to be a nice person you're trying to tell the truth be a good person they're not that's why why am i saying all this verse 11. the one doing what is wrong must still continue to do what is wrong and the one who is unclean must be made dirtier still you see what i'm getting at now it's when you get to verse 15 and you understand that verse 11 is talking about the ones judged in verse 15 you realize okay we're not just talking about people like you and me or some who have sinned maybe in excessive ways but have been forgiven right we know peter lied he denied jesus three times and in doing so lied three times when jesus needed him the most yet he was you so he was used in powerful ways but that so it doesn't the fact is he changed right and then he went on 
and displayed traits of racism against the non-Jewish Christians. And Paul confronted him, right? A Jewish Christian confronted Peter and says, no, and you stop this right now. You're not supposed to be doing that. Did Jesus come and set us free so you could show partiality and make these Gentile people feel bad? You're going you're gonna to bypass them in the, in the, in the, um, in the um, daily provisions and in all of the things that we're sharing together as one flock under one shepherd? You're going to act like that? What did Peter do? Did he get defensive? His ego rise up? Well, hey, you know, I've been appointed to feed his sheep. I was told multiple times, what about you? No, we don't have any indication of that. What we do is we have nothing from Peter in that regard, except that, you know, they, he actually defers to Paul in terms of kind of setting his writings in another level and saying that sometimes it's hard to understand. But I guarantee you, Peter did not have a hard time understanding Paul when it came to the Galatians. I guarantee you he was very clear, Paul that is, and Paul got the message. And then he started thinking more about what Paul was doing, the appointment by Jesus and all the things. This is how normal people would be even if they were directly appointed by Jesus, you see? So we all have to keep going. We all get our time. And if you choose to be righteous or try, we can't absolutely be righteous no more that we can absolutely be holy, right? Because we make mistakes. Was Peter absolutely holy? Absolutely righteous? No, I just gave you two examples where he denied Jesus three times and was acting like a racist. Yet he was forgiven, right? He wasn't then ongoingly condemned by the Gentiles and said, hey, you, you racist. <laughs> if you cannot forgive other people, what are you even doing claiming you know Jesus at all? It makes no sense. Right? Yet people, some of the people I've known a long time claim to be Christian, do these things. I'm not going to judge them ultimately, but I'll tell you what. I'm not so sure they know how to forgive that much. Either way, that's for them to decide. My point is there are righteous people and there are holy people. There are people who are doing wrong and unclean, and that's not going to change. We're both going to keep going until the last day or until our last day. But when it says those doing what are what is wrong will continue doing what is wrong, those who are unclean must be made dirtier still, this is what is being decided right now. Are you going to change course if you're dirty like Peter was, even being an associate of Jesus? And after his resurrection, he still changed and went on and did great things and was cut down for the message? Or are you gonna become more dirty? Are you gonna keep denying? Are you gonna keep showing racism? He could have done those things, but he did not. He stopped, turned around, and Jesus knew that. He saw something in him. It was probably a problem in some respects the whole time. He had unique personalities, we know. But look at what happened. He was used as an example of how someone can still be a Christian and do terrible things, be forgiven, and work together for the great message. It's not about you or me. It's about them. The second we start making it about us or these other things, then the other side wins. So let them become worse. If that's what they choose, you know, people don't want to change and become better. They want to keep abusing other people well just stay away why we can't we cannot change everyone's course what we can do is affect our course help people stay on their course if it's the right course and of course <laughs> not forget that we have to be aware of ourselves because like verse 14 says happy are those who wash their clothes we talked about clothes several times in our readings of the revelation and earlier on, when Jesus gave his messages to the Christian congregations, and he even said they were going to wash their clothes, some of them in ways he referenced their clothes, and how they actually thought, you know, they had one appearance but did not. But there were some who were approved, given access to the secret garden, the tree of life, 
And so here it's being described yet again. They might come in through the gates leading into the city. So it look, remember we were talking about earlier how you know the nations would bring their glory into it and how the leaves would be for the healing of the nations. And we talked a little bit about how in Revelation 21 that would likely be the healing from the things like death, sickness, sorrow, pain, outcry, all the things that we suffer from. But I was thinking more about it. Um, I believe it was Betsy that asked that question. And it's possible it's also some of the effects of when Satan is let back out, right? Because he's let out at some point that it appears to be prior to this final end point. But it may not be because of the way Revelation is broken up. Either way, if it is, it's possible we're all going to need to heal from him coming here again. Because, <laughs> right, he goes around the whole earth, misleads some again, and then there's one final battle around New Jerusalem, and then that's it. Josh says, no, you're done, done and done. Back to all these holy things. <clears throat> so, now let's talk a little bit more about Alpha and the Omega. And verse 13, I've talked about before how the discussion in this text and the uh, change in verse 16 to I, Jesus, matches the identical speech pattern of Revelation 1-4, where I, John, follows immediately after Alpha and the Omega, the one who is and who was and who was coming. You can see the prior videos on Alpha and Omega for that information. Or look in the description below. I put a link to a written um, discussion that I'm going to reference real briefly here because before we get into it, we're just going to take a quick look at some more text in Revelation 22. As many of you know, I've written a, several books um, and several editions of one book. And if you go to my Elihu Topical Index, you can get those books here if you go to Books and Media. But you can get a lot of free stuff if you just go to the Topical Index. Okay, so here you can see you've got A, Alpha and Omega, Parts 1, 2, 3 video. And then here you've got Alpha and Omega, Use of Terms in Revelation. So I click that, and that is right here from a section from my second edition, which is out of print now. If you've got a copy, an actual copy, good for you. You can get a digital copy of this, though, on the um, side of my page I just showed you, the books and media. So if you go to the topical index right here, use of terms in Revelation, Alpha and Omega, it's going to give you this section from this now out of print book, uh, Is Jesus the Alpha and the Omega? We go through each text. But on page, we're not going to read from this. I'm just going to show you. Right here uh, on page 181, from, from this point forward, all the way down to here, <laughs> really to the end of the section. So several pages I spend of, of text and time showing you the narrative changes and who's talking and when and why. But I'm going to do it now in an in a very brief fashion, but I encourage you to take a look at this discussion in the link below for more information. Okay, so we're going to switch over to a reading of Revelation 22, just a couple extra texts, okay? Now, as you know, I haven't translated all of them, uh, so we've been going through the day text based on what I have translated. So when I am going to read some text that I haven't translated, and some of these I have, it's just here I'm going to read uh, from the NWT because it will show continuously Revelation 22 in case I read over parts that I haven't done or refer to them like um, verse 16. So let me bring you guys in here. You can follow along as well. If you have a copy of the Bible that has Revelation 22, most do, unless it's a Jewish Bible, um, then you'll be able to find, this is the day text reading. You can find the description below, but it only has verses 10 through 15. So I'm going to set that over here. Go back to Revelation 22, NWT. Now, let me just bring this in a little bit more so you can see Rev. Okay, let me show you why. Remember I said at the outset, I said that um, in verse 10 or... Um, Yes, see, what was the read? Oh, it's NWT, so it's different. <laughs> That's why I'm looking at it thinking, wait a minute, it's a, in the day text, it says the one speaking to me, but then I was switching over to the NWT. So from our day text, as you know, 
I said earlier um, that in verse 10, the one speaking to, to me, to, to John, is an angel. And so why do I say that? Well, all right, so let's take a look at a little bit more of Revelation. Starting in verse 1, you notice it says, he, okay, we'll, we'll get to the uh, person showing John these things in a moment. He showed me a river of water of life. And then it describes it more. We did this reading. It talks about, so this is the description. They will see his face. His name will be on their foreheads. Night will be no more. Okay, then it says in verse 6, He said to me, These words are faithful and true. Lord God of the inspired expressions sent his angel to show his slaves what must take place. I am coming quickly. Look, there's, look, there's no break here, right? He said to me, so he's still speaking. The one who showed him the river of life and who he refers to here as he said to me, these words are faithful and true. I am coming quickly. Happy is anyone observing the prophecy, words of the prophecy of this scroll. Who do you think this is? I think it's an angel. Why? Look at verse 8. Well, I, John, and again, as I said before, that's it's the only difference between this and some of the other texts is that it, it, it provides a different, a variant form of uh, of Kai and Ego, and it combines them as Kago, so and I. But really, it's the the first person pronoun I, very similar to what you see in verse sixteen, but which is identical in verse Revelation one four, identical to verse sixteen. I talked about this in prior Alpha and the Omega shows, but notice John responds to the one who's saying these things to me. Right? And says, I am coming quickly. John was the one hearing and seeing these things. He says, I, John. And he says, when I heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel that had been showing me these things. The angel is the one who just said this. I am coming quickly. And he has been talking to John the whole time, or at least one of them. What does the angel say? He says to me, unlike the prince of the army of Jehovah, when Joshua fell down on his face, this angel says, be careful, do not do that. All I am is a fellow slave of you and of your brothers who are prophets and of those observing the words of this scroll. Worship God. He also tells me, the one who just told him, I am coming quickly. He's speaking for God and Jesus, as I've said consistently in all of our day texts and Alpha and Omega videos. He also tells me, verse 10, do not seal up the words of the prophecy. Then this is our reading, right? Look, I am coming quickly. That same one who's been showing them, showing him these things the whole time, who in verse 7 said, I am coming quickly, and to whom John then fell down to worship, the angel but who said, don't do that. Why? Because he's talking for other people, God and Jesus, the ones who sent him. That's why he can say, I am coming quickly and the reward I give. Now you see why John would do this, right? John is thinking, well, the, he's acting the same way that people like Joshua and Manoah and his wife acted. It's just, this isn't Michael. <laughs> this isn't Jesus. This is, this is the, an actual messenger angel talking exactly like God and Jesus. And that's why John started to worship him. And he goes on right after telling him not to do that and who he is, fellow slave and the angel, an angel. John says the angel uh, that was talking to him right after that angel tells him who he is and says, don't do that. That same angel, he also tells me, verse 10, look, I am coming quickly and the reward I give is with me to render to each one as his work is. I am the alpha and the omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. And then notice the angel goes on and talks the whole way through the end of our reading. Right after that angel speaks, 
for God in these ways and possibly Jesus? Verse 16, I, Jesus, sent my angel. Jesus hasn't been talking. The one who's been talking is identified right here. And yet we have Trinitarian apologetic nuts out there running around destabilizing people's faith because they can't handle the text. They can't handle what it's teaching. Jesus is not good enough for them unless he's the Alpha and the Omega. You understand what I'm saying? They cannot accept this kind of angelic representation even if it is stated for us in those very words in the text, I, Jesus, sent my angel. Even if it says God gave Jesus a revelation, they're going to say he still had it. He still knew all that stuff from all eternity or they gave it to his human nature. And, um, you know, he's not two persons in one. He's still one. He's just got two natures and one knows everything. And the other doesn't, right? All the retarded stuff, all the contradictory things you would expect from people who are not teaching these things. And that's what gets me so fired up. I have to spend all this time, write all this stuff, and I get all these Trinitarian nuts and people who just can't take the time and read the text like we just did. And that's why I tell you all regularly to be careful with your time. Otherwise, you'll get frustrated like me thinking about these things when we should be talking about the words of the prophecy of this scroll because the appointed time is near. These are Trinitarian nuts who have lost touch with the text and who keep promoting this false view of a triune God that's inconsistent with the text and then mislead people and argue with them about the metaphysics they barely understand, if at all, because we don't even really understand it all. They're focusing on those things and putting other people down, and yet they're openly exposed by a simple reading of the text.